Please be seated for the first reading of the Old Testament read to us by our minister. The reading is from Isaiah 58, chapters 1 to 12. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why do we humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly, your vindicator shall go before you, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Steve, God. God. Thank you, Eileen. It's so mightily read for us. Very meaningful. Thank you. So we are reminded of the fast that God calls us to. Let us join together. I suggest we read the psalm in unison tonight. Uh, contrary to our usual custom of side to side in the chapel, let us read it all together as one. We say together Psalm 90 verses 1 to 12. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, whatever you have formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to us and say, turn back to mortals. For a thousand years in your sight, or like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the 
very powerful psalm, isn't it? It's the psalm which is often read at funerals. Let us stand and sing our gradual hymn as we contemplate our sin. We are reminded of the commandment. And of course, the great commandments are to love God and to love one another. Therefore, we sing number 411, Let there be love shared among us, to remind us of that of which we are repenting, which is being unloving to God and others. 411, Let there be love shared. I think we can sing it through twice, Mary.
For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. And Lord, we ask that you would guide us and enable us and strengthen us to keep a holy fast through these 40 days uh, with you as we journey with you through the wilderness season of Lent. We remember the time of the Israelites 40 years wandering in the wilderness. We ask that you would grant us the strength to complete the journey and to be faithful to the fast that we commit to. We ask that you would hear our prayers and strengthen us in your service. We may come through this Lenten season to a joyful, victorious celebration of the resurrection at Easter time, strengthened to go out and to proclaim the gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. Oh, I saw you fanning. Did you feel are you warm back there? Is it warm? Yeah. It's a bit warm. Uh, are you fanning warm? Well, we can actually make it cooler. Um, so this time, do you know how to operate the aircon? You, it's very simple. You can just make it cooler. Turn the numbers down. You can turn the numbers down. This last week, as you know, uh, I've been uh, privileged to be in Australia to have the medical checkups, and uh, on the medical, uh, on the doctor's notes, um, it had these initials M E D, and I wasn't sure what N E D meant, uh, so I had to Google it. Does anybody know what N E D means? It means no evidence of disease. Isn't that lovely? So thanks be to God. Um, <laughs> no evidence uh, found of disease. So that's good news. Not to say it can't come back, it could, but I would believe that it won't. And uh, he's very confident that it won't. So uh, we'll go back and see him again in another six months and uh, get radiated again and uh, with a CT. I, I thought he'd said no more radiation, but he said no more PET scans. No more PET scans, but we still need to have CTs every six months. So um, when I was there, uh, it was funny because uh, we attended, uh, we attended uh, my nephew's uh, Pentecostal church in uh, Melbourne West. And uh, they're lovely people, they're so loving, and we, we love to go there and to be with them because they're so loving. And he's, he's a great preacher, and he preaches biblically and he preaches 20 minutes every week. You'd love him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's a very disciplined preacher, and he's a very good preacher. And I discovered, I said when I was there, Do you write all your own material, or do you work as a team? He said, No, we work as a team. So they have a long team of Pentecostal preachers on the East Coast and they, they take it in turn, they meet together, they brainstorm and they take it in turns to do the writing of the sermons and then the others vet the sermons and critique them and then they polish them and then so they'll take it in turns so they don't have to constantly write sermons. I thought, well, what a sensible system. Uh, it's very sensible. I don't know why we I mean, can sound so sensible. Uh, we're just all the Lone Ranger doing our own thing. Anyway, he's, he's a great, great preacher, Bronson, and uh, was greatly loved. And it was very uh, important for us being with him when we were back there last year, because his father, uh, Larry, uh, had, um, had come into, gone into the ministry as a young man because he'd been miraculously healed from cancer. Now, you know, when I went into the cancer last year, I had two pastor friends who had cancer. And they, they, they both died, one just the year before I had the cancer, and one while I had the cancer, my other friend. They were both very good friends. Uh, and they were both, I, I would say in all honesty, much more godly uh, people than me. Um, um, I probably believe in miracles more than they did, but I was really lucky that I had a kind of cancer which they, which they know how to treat, which they can treat. As you know, there's about 200 kinds of cancer. Um, but at any rate, um, at this church, uh, the senior pastor who is now retired, who started the church, his son is now leading it, Bronson, but the senior pastor, the father, uh, Larry, had founded the church many decades ago. And he'd gone into the ministry because he was completely, miraculously healed from metastasized cancer. He had metastatic testicular cancer all through his body. And he went to a revival meeting and people laid hands on him and it disappeared just like that completely. It's a remarkable story. 
And it's what, it's what changed his life and launched him into ministry. The interesting thing was, I asked him how he felt, and he said, you know, Stephen, he said at the time, I had just become a Christian. And he said, I was so in love with Jesus, I didn't care about the cancer. He said, I, I was prepared to, to go to heaven and be with the Lord. And I thought it was quite strange and bizarre, because, you know, I mean, I believe in heaven, and I believe in salvation, and I believe in the Lord. But I was still scared of uh, having the cancer. Uh, very, very concerned and very scared of it. Larry said, no, he said, I was so, I was just, you know, like a new Christian, and so in love with Jesus. He said, isn't it ironic that someone who's quite happy to go to heaven doesn't get to go there, and the rest of us who don't want to go there sometimes have to go there. But, you know, God has a strange sense of humor sometimes. At any rate, I found a verse in Isaiah, I can tell it to you later if you want, that says that um, sometimes God, God takes the faithful, he takes the ones he loves the most, to save them from the trouble and strife of life. There's a thought for you. All right, so I was at the Pentecostal church, and, um, and they, were, <laughs> they were very pleased with themselves because they, they were having 21 days of prayer and fasting. And they, they didn't know it was Lent. You know, Pentecostals don't know what season it is. I remember once I, I was in Geneva, and I, I, it was Pentecost Sunday at the time, many years ago in the 80s, and I thought, oh, I'll go to a Pentecostal church because it's Pentecost Sunday. Right? You know, where, where else to go on Pentecost Sunday but a Pentecostal church? It must be really fun, you know, they must be swinging from the chandeliers on Pentecost Sunday. So I went along, they didn't know it was Pentecost Sunday, <laughs> and they had nothing special at all. So I was very let down. So anyway, I, I think my friends in, um, they know Christmas and Easter, but that's about it. So at this church, I don't think they knew it was Lent, but they had felt as a denomination to have a season of prayer and fasting and to call on God for revival. And they were very pleased with themselves, and they, and they were saying, we're going to have 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I wanted to put my hand up and say, we Anglicans do 40. <laughs> I, I resisted, you know, that would be very godly to do that, be in keeping with my ungodly personality. Anyway, I, I, didn't, I even resisted the temptation not to drop it during coffee. So you'd be proud of me. I didn't say anything. And I just encouraged them. I said, oh, well, that's wonderful, 21 days. Anyway, they're going for it. God bless them. So we're, we're beginning today the first day of Lent, which is supposed to be the beginning of your 40 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, so I, I hope that you've thought about what it is you want to fast. And you know, as, as Anglicans, we have this tradition that in Lent we give up something during Lent. Sometimes we take up something. So um, traditionally we would you know, give up a meal a day, or give up a meal a week, or give up chocolate, or give up uh, social media or give up wine, or whatever it is. And uh, last week, my, my wife, I'm, I'm trying to get my wife to give up wine because she loves a glass, and, God bless her. and you know, I, I just learned last year, all the research has come out, that, that alcohol causes seven kinds of cancer. I don't say that to depress you, it's just a fact. And they're, they're now listing alcohol as on a par with tobacco. It's, it's uh, as damaging as tobacco in terms of its capacity to cause, uh, to cause uh, cancer. I haven't had the courage to have this conversation with our friend Eddie yet. <laughs> Not sure I will, but I think you should go into another line of business. Because I reckon, I mean, this is an interesting question in 20 years. Whether, you know, 20 years ago, everybody smoked, and, or 40 years ago, everybody smoked and nobody thought anything of it. And then now, how do anybody smokes? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if in 20 years, not many people will be drinking. Because we, we now know that alcohol directly causes seven kinds of cancer. And it's an accelerant for all other kinds of cancer. So, it's <laughs> a few people looking nervous, and no worries. Uh, as someone said to me, well, Stephen, everything causes cancer, so, we, which is true. But anyway, so I was trying to convince Crystal, and she said, well, I'll give up, I'll give up um, wine if, if, you, if you give up McDonald's. So I said, something done, sold. You know, no problem. It's always KFC, after all. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, darling. No. I guess I have to, in the spirit of that, give up all the junk food. So, um, I wonder if you've thought about what you'd like to give up for Lent. Um, <laughs> I hope you won't give up going to church. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's been done before. Uh, and, but in, in the modern era, people have thought, well, maybe it's good to be positive, not just negative. And they've suggested a kind of fast where we so-called take something up instead of just giving something up. So perhaps you could take up uh, praying uh, five minutes each morning if you don't, or reading um, a chapter of the Bible, or uh, doing 
a good deed with no strings attached for somebody, or doing something anonymously for, for someone, uh, maybe once a day or once a week. And I really would challenge you to not just let this pass by, but to think about it seriously tonight and make a decision. If you haven't already, don't just say, oh yes, I'll listen to this and then forget about it. Really think, think seriously about what it is that you could give up. Of course, in Lent, um, the heart of the meaning of Ash Wednesday and Lent is to remind ourselves, Ash Wednesday reminds us of our mortality. Uh, remember that you are dust, from dust you came to dust you'll return. We're reminded of our mortality and we're encouraged to repent. So Ash Wednesday is about our mortality and it's about our need to, to repent. So and we had our new, who gave us a great sermon on Sunday, um, exploring the subject of confession. And uh, before we can repent, before we can um, re repent, we need to confess uh, our sin before the Lord. And, um, and there, as Annie has pointed out to us, there's a lot of things we need to, to confess. And uh, it's not necessarily a simple thing to begin to confess. So I want to challenge you uh, in this season to take these disciplines seriously. And not just to come to Ash Wednesday for a little liturgy. Our, our liturgy is not very fancy anyway. We don't sort of sing the Psalms, or we could sing the 51st Psalm and, and so on. Um, not the 51st, well, so yeah, the 51st Psalm. But, but we, we, we don't, we have a simple liturgy. So, you know, you're not coming for the entertainment value, obviously. But I hope you will take the meaning away and really prayerfully consider. I, I had a message uh, from Glyn Duggan who sent me a message saying, I'm going to give up being a drug dealer and an international assassin. How about you? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, okay, buddy. <laughs> so, so uh, oh, that made me laugh, actually. So, he's a funny man sometimes. So, uh, you know, what, what are you going to give up? You're going to give up being a drug dealer and an international assassin? Um, I'm sure if we think about uh, Andy's sermon on Sunday, there's some things there we can give up. Uh, and uh, so I really want to challenge you about that. Tonight, as we reflect on the central meaning of Ash Wednesday, being about our mortality and about um, fasting um, as an expression of repentance, um, I'd like us to, to think a little bit about more deeply about the meaning of Ash Wednesday. Um, Ash Wednesday surely is about us. You know, I love in sermons to point out that we make things that are about Christ or about God, we make them about us. We make everything about ourselves. And it's a really kind of temptation to break in the first commandment. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make an idol. But what we love to do is we, we love to make everything in theology about ourselves. And um, I've often mentioned this uh, in, in sermons, it comes up. Uh, when we discuss theology, um, there's, a, there's a, a contemporary saying, it's not all about you, buddy. You know, when you have someone who's being self-centered or narcissistic and we say, we jokingly say, hey mate, it's not all about you. It's about other people to be considered. Um, and that's something that I think we need to say to ourselves about our theology. We, we think that it's about us. One example is when people give testimonies. And in many times over the years, I've invited people to give their testimonies in churches in Hong Kong and Macau. And invariably, when people write their testimony, they think it's about them. Easy mistake to make, right? It's my testimony, my life story. It must be about me, right? I'm telling you my life story, how I came to faith. Surely that's about me. No, it's not about you. And this is something people don't understand. Because your testimony is not about you fundamentally. It's about what Christ has done in your life. The prime actor in your testimony should not be you, it should be God. And so very often what people do is when they give their testimony, they get up and they tell you their life story. I'm thinking, I don't want to hear your life story, I don't care. <laughs> and it's not about your life story. I mean, people's life stories are often very interesting. But I want to hear what God has done. I want to hear God's story. And sometimes people say that we are the fifth gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then, and then there's, uh, you know, uh, Helen and, and Willem and and Brian and Eileen and so on. We are the fifth gospel. Your, your life is the story of what Jesus has done uh, in your life. So that's one example. Now these are easy mistakes to make. 
When I was in the Pentecostal church again this week, there was a lovely a lady woman who got up to welcome everybody, and she said, oh, in a couple of weeks we're going to have baptism. And I'd heard this before because my nephew got rebaptized there recently. Uh, he'd been baptized by my brother as an infant. And uh, in this Pentecostal church, you know, they had to rebaptize him. So, um, so she got up and she was announcing the baptisms, and, and she said, well, you know, baptism is when we stand up and we profess our faith in Jesus. And I thought to myself, no. <laughs> you know, Jewish theology, no, 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 it's not. And actually, this is the Anabaptist, this is the Baptist belief, and Pentecostals are Anabaptists. They, they believe, but they don't believe in infant baptism, they believe in adult baptism, and they think that baptism is something I do. And this is very easily disproved, because no one in history has ever gone in the bathtub or the shower and said, I baptize me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If baptism was something you could do, then you could just get the hose on a Sunday morning and stand outside church and say, hey, everybody, I baptize me. Or you could jump in the church lake and say, hey, everybody, I baptize me. It's clearly something passive. It's something that's done to us. And the condition for baptism is our profession of faith or the profession of faith. So, um, but we have made, again, we've made the, the condition which we fulfill the thing in itself. But it's not, baptism is not something you do. It's not about when you stand up and say, I believe in Jesus, which I was told on Sunday with all gospel certainty from the front by my my penny gospel sister. I wanted to jump up and say, hey, guys, I have a good sermon on that. But of course, it's not my place. And you know, you've heard me talk about this before. Recently, we've had the confirmations, and we've done the same thing with confirmation. We've made the precondition, the part that we fulfill, which is the profession of faith. We've made that us confirming God. So my confirmation is me confirming God. When actually originally in the scripture in Acts chapter 8, confirmation is God confirming, meaning con meaning with and firmare meaning strengthen God, strengthening us with the Holy Spirit. It's the Episcopal laying on of hands. And once again, no one in history has ever, ever laid hands on them and said, I confer thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Strengthen, Lord, this thy servant with the Holy Spirit. No one has ever done that. We receive it through the apostolic laying of hands or through the divine encounter with the Spirit of God falling upon us. But no one can confirm themselves because it is a gift of grace, just like baptism, just like your life in Christ and your testimony, they're gifts of grace. And we, we, we like to make everything in the Christian life about us. We want to keep putting ourselves back in the middle. And we do it theologically. We have whole denominations based on it. This is astounding. You know, the rule number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, but I'll be in the middle. <laughs> no other gods before me, you know. It's like Christ is in the middle. Like, that's okay, but I'll, let me stand here for a while, you know. And we actually make a the theology around it. Um, and we, we speak of communion as making my communion, you know, instead of as the gift of we, and we come and we, we take, you know, people come and they take the communion as it, instead of receiving it as a gift of, of God's grace and mercy, which it is to us. Um, we make our, our baptism, uh, we make our baptism a, a naming ceremony for infants, which is such an impoverished understanding of baptism. We make confirmation and a coming of age rite uh, for young men, just like the Bar Mitzvah, the Jewish times when young men would learn the law and then they would become men at the age of 13 or 14 because they'd memorized the law and they'd have their bar mitzvah. So and actually that's that's one of the foundations of where uh, confirming teenagers came from. It's based partly on the Old Testament idea. I didn't mention that in the class we had, but it's partly based on the idea of the bar mitzvah, the Jewish young man coming of age having learned the law. So we make, we make of God's things uh, something which we call our thing. We make ourselves the initiator, we make ourselves the center. But surely, Ash Wednesday is about us. Surely. It's about our need for repentance. It's about our need for mortality. No one can say of God, from dust you came and to dust you will return. That's just us, right? Surely it can't be about God. Surely we must be in the center of Ash Wednesday. And it's, it's not even a sacrament. Nobody thinks it's a sacrament. It's a, it's a made-up rite of the church that we've invented to help us with our uh, observing of a preparation season for Easter, before Easter. Now, it is very ancient. 
uh, the practice of putting ashes on the head of, of Christian believers as a preparation of penitence before Easter is very ancient. It goes back to the second century. What they used to do is they would have a bowl of ashes and they'd come along the road and they'd sprinkle ashes on your head. Instead of, you know, it's very civilized, you know, like the sign of the cross, you know, very nice. In the old days, they'd walk along with a bowl, some view, some view, some view. I mean, you would have got dirty, right? That's how they used to do it. And um, Henry, when, when the English church, the Anglican church, began to move towards Protestant theology, Henry VIII, you know, previously had been a staunch Catholic, and he was rather fond of Ash Wednesday. So he decreed that Ash Wednesday should be retained. And when Cranmer became Archbishop, within his Archbishopric, he banned it. So uh, Archbishop Cranmer's uh, uh, communicants had no Ash Wednesday. But then after Cranmer, uh, it gradually came back. And now by mo the modern era, you have the, even the Baptists and Pentecostals and Methodists and, and others uh, all the Calathumpians and the Durians, they're all having Ash Wednesday as well. So, uh, so Ash Wednesday has now been accepted in general by the wider Protestant community, which is quite interesting. So it's, it's a human tradition, but surely, surely we are at the center of it. So I want to ask you tonight, um, a little bit bizarrely, to see whether you can put Christ at the center of Ash Wednesday. Um, you see, if in, in our thinking, we can say, well, this isn't really just about us. So, very simply, let me ask you, your sins, whose are they? Whose, whose are your sins? Against God. Against God. Our Sin sins are against God, but, but who do they belong to? Right? They belong to us, but do they? If you're in Christ, do your sin, are they your sins? Do they belong to you? I, I think we could consider that our, our sins belong to Christ. Because didn't he carry them on the tree? Didn't he bear our sins upon him on Calvary? Didn't he take our sin upon him? Isn't that what scripture teaches us? Didn't he pay the price for our sin with his blood? Surely if he, if he did, if, if our sins, St. Paul says that our sins were nailed to the cross with Christ. So whose sins are they? They're his sins. They belong to him. We, we have repented of our sins. And we have given them to him. And he has paid the price for it. If we're in Christ, then our sin belongs to him. And whose death is it? Whose death is, is your death? Is it your death? Surely we will all die. The scripture talks of the first death and the second death. The first death being our physical death and the second death being the judgment of God on those who are not accepted into uh, heaven. Um, so the New Testament, I think Revelation uses that language of the first and the second death. But your, your death, your first death, your physical death, uh, um, whose death, who does it belong to? It belongs to Christ. Scripture says that we who have, uh, have died with Christ, that when we went into our baptism, water of baptism, we died with Christ. We died our death. And our death was buried with Him, and we were raised to new life with Him. He died, and the Scripture says He died our death. He died in our place. He took our death upon Him. He took our sin upon Him, and He took our death upon Him. And He conquered sin and death. So therefore, we look forward to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. This is the faith we have. So our death is not our own anymore. It belongs to Him. So when you're reminded, uh, from dust you came and to dust you will return, you know, um, yes, we have to go through that death, but it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Him. It's His death. He died it for us so that we might live. He has paid the price for our sin and death. He's conquered sin and death. He's conquered sin and death. So even... Even our sin and death, in, in, in Ash Wednesday, we, we come to repent of our sin by the wearing of ash. Ancient custom, in the, in the Old Testament, people put ash on in sackcloth as a symbol of grief. Uh, maybe something terrible happened. When Tamar was raped by her half-brother, she wore sackcloth and ash as a symbol of her heartbrokenness and grief. 
but it also is a symbol of grief for sin. So Jesus says to Bethsaida and Chorazon in Matthew 11, Woe to you, Bethsaida and Chorazon, if the miracles that were done uh, here in, in Capernaum were done in, in you, uh, here in Galilee were done in you, in, in Bethsaida and Chorazon, then, then you would have repented in sackcloth. Oh, I'm confused. You know what I mean. If the, if the miracles that were, were done... Sorry. In one place. There's, you understand what I mean. We're not in you. I'm sorry, you have to look at Matthew 11, something, 21. Something. Then, I'm sorry, foggy brain. If the miracles were done in you, then you would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. So, anyway, he refers to the practice of wearing ash as a kind of repentance. So, even Jesus refers to this practice of wearing ash as a symbol. So, it represents sorrow for sin, it represents grief and sorrow for, for sin. Uh, but it also, of course, the dust represents our death, that we are mortal, that it, that it is, it is our, as our death, that we are reminded of our mortality, and therefore our need. To repent, our need, our need for our death to become his death, our need for our death to become his death. In this season, we can reflect not only what can we give up for Lent, but also what can we return to him from whom we have taken it. When we sin, we take things that belong to God or others, and we take them for ourselves. And when we, when we, for example, when I give up McDonald's, what I'm doing is I'm giving back to God the authority over my body and my diet and my health. So fasting is actually giving back to God something that we've stolen, something that belongs to Him. When you give up wine because it's unhealthy for you during Lent, you're giving back to God oversight of something that actually belongs to Him. Our bodies, all says, uh, our bodies belong to Him, and we should glorify Him in the way we use them. When we give Him our time to use in service or in prayer, we're giving back to Him something we've stolen from Him. Maybe we're using our time to do something we shouldn't be doing. We say, well, I'll use that time for what He wants me to use it for. So you could think of a fast not just of giving up something, but of giving back something that actually should really belong to, to Christ in the first place. And this is our spiritual discipline. A theologian called Catherine Sonderegger, in her book Systematic Theology, commented on the sacrifices detailed in Leviticus and makes a connection to the Passover and the Lord's Supper and turns the focus onto one who, she says, became ashes in our place. So she actually compares Jesus to the ash. He was immolated. He was burned in the Passion of Holy Week. And he became the ash. The sacrifice of the Holy Son is the climax of the 40 days and of the Passion account of Holy Week. The sacrifice is costly. The sacrifice is love. And the Passion of Christ shows us this. And here tonight we lift up the sacrificial meal. The body broken. The blood shed. Immolated for us on the altar in the fire of God's love. The Passover meal of the Passion of Christ. St. John describes Jesus in his Gospel as the Lamb of God. You remember that the Lamb would be burnt as a sacrificial offering, so that the angel of death would pass over, and the judgment of God would pass over. John also describes Jesus as the Passover Lamb. So the Son is slaughtered, He becomes ash, as the Son descends on the day of preparation before Passover. John has the Passover on the day, John has the Last Supper on the day before the Passover. It's a little bit different to the other three Gospels. And the reason John does that is because on the day before the Passover is when the lambs were being sacrificed in the temple. So they're, they're sacrificing the, the pure lambs the night before the Passover meal in preparation. And so maybe that's the night it happened. Maybe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John got it wrong. We're not sure. Who got it right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or it's John the Evangelist? We don't know. Was Jesus was uh, was Jesus Passover on the night before the Passover, or was it the Last Supper on the Passover night? 
We don't know. But either way, all four gospel writers make a connection between Passover and sacrifice. These two things are, are interwoven. So the Passover and the sacrifice are kind of twins, doublets, a relationship which is connected. So Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed to be sure for us. But the meal over which Christ presides evokes His death, His brokenness, His pouring out of Himself for us. You see, we come back to Him. He is the ash. He is the broken sacrifice. This is my body, Luke says, which is given for you. Or Luke, as Jesus say. In Mark, Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant. This is my sacrifice, my death, my sin. He, everything belongs to Him. Even your sin and your death belong to Him. And in this lies our hope. In understanding this lies our hope. He has it all. Do this in remembrance of me, Paul quotes Jesus in 1 Corinthians 11. In Matthew, Jesus promises the disciples his blood poured out will be for the remission of sin. The sacrifice of his life is a sealing of the covenant and a remedy for sin. The sin is remedied by him. The sin belongs to him. The covenant is his. He seals it. The meal of his sacrifice is a sharing in his holiness poured down on the weary and sin-sick soil of our hearts. When we examine this sacrificial meal from the perspective of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we see the Trinitarian pattern. Fire, the fire of judgment falls from the inner sanctum of God's very self and terminates in the self-giving of the Son, burned to ashes on the hard wood of the cross. The meal so lavishly spread on the table proclaims his death, his death, until he comes again. The Trinity is interwoven here, Father, Son, and Spirit, a community of death and life into which we are drawn. And the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup is a sharing in his death, washing away our sin, granting us spiritual health, clothing us with his sacrifice, drawing near in awe to the holiness who is love. We place our hands upon the head of the sacrificial lamb, imparting our sin to him. He takes our sin upon him, the scapegoat. He is the scapegoat. We receive, and we receive in those same hands from him the gift of ransom in healing. He has taken our sin in death, and in return he has given us healing, wholeness, and eternal life. This happens in the covenant meal and in the sacrifice. There is a Trinitarian exchange. The divine fire enacts its infinite movement. As the Son descends among us, eternally begotten from the Holy of Holies, burned to ashes on the cross, the altar of self-offering, and then wonderfully rising from the dead in the Spirit's power, the gift of God's self consummated into the highest heaven. This is holiness. This is love. This is the life of God, the Trinity. The triune Lord sanctifies himself for our salvation. The ashes are his, the death is his, the life is his. Just as a, Psalm 103, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are but dust. What will you return to him in this Lenten season, which doesn't belong to you? hasn't changed some things. All right. Let's turn to page 7 in the bulletin. 
The ashes are here on the Lord's table. Blessed are you, God of all creation. You are eternal and we are mortal. You are formed from the dust of the earth. As we receive these ashes, make them a sign for us of repentance and returning to you. Breathe into us again the breath of life. We say together, breathe into us again the breath of life. Blessed be God forever. I invite you to come forward and to kneel and to receive the sign of the ashes. I decided to come and lead us in the litany of repentance. Thank you. 
judging others and bearing grudges. For skimping on our commitments and relationships, for failing in hospitality. For tolerating oppression, injustice, and wrong. For keeping silent when we should have spoken up. For turning away when others have offered us love. For closing our hearts when others have needed compassion. For all we have done unkindly, unjustly, and dishonestly. For our careless speech and hurtful words. Most merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And in what we have failed to do, we have not loved you with our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love in the way you begin in your life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear these words of absolution with our hearts turned to God in repentance, with the knowledge of our sins laid bare before the cross of Jesus Christ. In the name of the living God, your sins are forgiven. Receive God's mercy, take hold of your forgiveness, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in the light of Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand for the words of the greeting of peace here. Christ has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We live in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Let us sing our offertory hymn, which is number 7, bar uh, 4, 6.
Please follow along uh, in the order of service that you have. Let us uh, pray, those of you who are familiar with the words, it's not in the order of service, I can say that. Uh, but if you know the prayer, please join with us. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. We pray the offering prayer. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. And in the order of service, the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. With all our hearts we praise you, faithful God. In the beginning you called light to shine in darkness. You made living things to grow and flourish. And you created human beings in your image. You chose us in love, guided us by your presence, and blessed us with your holy law. Yet we chose our own sinful ways. We broke your commandments, persecuted your prophets, forgot your wisdom, and time after time refused to answer your call. So you spoke an eternal word in a human voice, in Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary, son of God. He called and people followed, leaving every other loyalty. He set us free to praise your holy name. But hatred and violence shouted Jesus down, Betrayed and abandoned and nailed to a cross, he laid down his life for the world he loved and broke the chains of evil and death. Then you turned our sorrow into joy, and on the third day you raised him up to lead your people into life. So we praise you, holy God, with angels and archangels and all your faithful people, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, O Sanity in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And on the night before he died, Jesus gathered with his friends to share a meal and to wash their feet, teaching one more lesson of love. And he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. And then he took the cup of wine and blessed you, Lord, and gave it to them, saying, Take this and drink it. This is my blood, sealing God's promise to forgive your sins. Whenever you do this, do it in memory of me. As we share these holy gifts, his body broken and his blood shed, these ashes, we remember the Lord Jesus for the love you taught us, the sacrifice you made for us, and the hope you give us we acclaim you, O Christ, saying, Thy you destroyed our death. Christ, you destroyed our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. And now, faithful God, send your Holy Spirit to feed us with the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Make us one body in Christ. Send us as your messengers in the world and fill us with energy, courage, and love. And now to you, most holy God, through Christ your Son and in the Spirit's power, we bring our worship and our songs of praise, declaring, Blessing, Blessing and honour and, and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. And as our Saviour Christ taught his disciples, we are confident to pray, Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, your will be done, your will be done, gifts of God for the people of God. Let us draw near with faith. Amen. It's 
not our custom to sing at the communion hymn, but Mary may play some music for us. So Mary, I invite you to come first. <laughs> Let's turn to page 12 in the order of service. Let us pray this post communion prayer. We thank you, O oh God, for all the blessing of this table, for the life giving story, the living bread, and the wine of new creation. Send us, we pray, in the strength of this meal to tell the good news to neighbors and strangers with creative words and compassionate service, walking the way. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn number 224, He Who Would Valiant Be. I'll say the blessing from the back of the <laughs>
say these responsive prayers. God of life and death, you have created all that is. You call us to yourself. Our salvation has been wrought. Our flowering and our passing, all the seasons of the vine belong to you. Bless us now and in all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming, dear friends. It's so encouraging to see you all here this evening. Uh, do please stay for some tea and a hot chocolate, I think Professor Duggan has for us. Um, and may you have a holy and meaningful Lent. I, I can't believe it's only an hour and a quarter. I must have, must have done something wrong. <laughs> all right. Thank you, man. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all. I think um, I think we're on in the side, the covered area, for some reason. So we're going to take this.